with natural pass controls, um, you know, that's mother nature's, you know, self-defense as you may want to call it. And, um, with some of the stuff I've seen and some of the stuff that we've studied in the past, I'm glad I'm born a human being because I would hate, um, to be at the bottom of the food chain, uh, where some of these insects are, they, uh, they, they can go through some horrible, horrible, um, deaths you might per se by some of the predators out there, but off the top of your head, guys, what do you think of when you hear natural pest controls? Like what, what topic or what, what part of it comes to your mind uh, when you think of natural pest controls? Other animals taking care of other pests? Yes, big time. The predatories, uh, the predators that are out there. Um, Predatory mites? Yes, yep. Wasp. Wasp, wasp is a big one. Predatory wasp is a, is a big one. Those guys can do some, some damage on some aphids. And it's it's weird. How does that uh, how does that parasitic wasp kill the aphids? What do they actually do? Use them for a hatchery. Do I, John? They use them for a hatchery. Yes. Yeah. Egg, then. <laughs> That's exactly what they do. It's uh, uh, kind of a bad way to go, right, man? Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, when, when they, when they drill that hole in the side of the aphid and they, uh, uh, they lay their eggs inside the aphid, they're, uh, uh, you know, those, those little, those young, young wasps, they have a nice warm place, you know, to kind of hang out. And when they hatch, they have a readily available food source. So the aphids are eaten from the inside out. They, their guts are eaten out. If you ever look and you see a little black dot on the aphid, whether or not you stick it under a microscope or whatever, but that little black circle, that means it's been killed by a parasitic wasp. So what are some other parasitic or uh, what are some other natural pest controls out there that we may or may not be able to use as a resource when it comes to, to our pest management services? Y'all remember seeing the B movie with Tom Hanks? I can't remember the actual name of it. And that's been several years ago, but I just remember my little girls watching it. There's bacteria like Bacillus thuringiensis. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But back to that B movie, what were the bees afraid of? Ants. Ants. They were, yeah. What else? What else were they flying from and trying to take cover from? The weather, the raindrops. Yeah. So we got we got a lot of rain coming in tomorrow and stuff. That's actually going to to kill a lot of insects. It'll kill a lot of ants. What are some other things? Climate, weather, yep. we got Cold parasites, weather. we got peritosoids, we got disease, the predators. So there's a lot of things out there that actually keep our pest numbers in check. But a lot of the times we as humans, we disturb that that ecosystem and we've got to learn how to, to reestablish it and not to damage it uh, the way we have been in the past. So let's look at our objectives. We will identify what are natural pest controls. We will identify what are pests. We will identify how they actually work. The natural pest controls work and we'll identify ways that we can actually use these natural mm -hmm. pest controls. Now, in the landscape setting, I'll admit it's it's a little tough to do that. Um, we're not going to release, you know, uh, ladybugs into the landscape. I mean, they're just going to fly off. But it's very good and very beneficial for you know maybe a greenhouse owner 
to release those ladybugs inside the greenhouse. They're going to stay contained in that area and they're not going to actually uh, fly off. But in the in this lesson, we're going to look at the balance of nature and some of the fundamental ways in which living organisms control their own population and the populations of other living organisms. And, and you'll see that always, you know, even, uh, you know, a female dog, you know, when she has a litter of puppies, you know, they always tend to um, shy away the, the weakling uh, or the weaker ones uh, so that the the stronger pups will actually be able to survive. The mother won't feed yes. uh, the little puppy. They're actually controlling their own population. They, they get rid of the, the weak ones mm -hmm. and kind of a sad situation, but it's, it's just the way nature works right. and uh, nature can be a beast. And uh, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm thankful I was born a human being and not having to deal with some of that stuff. I don't know, kind of skip over that. It was from a different lecture. But obviously, yeah. when we look at all living organisms, we are including the subset of organisms that we regard as pests. Now, there are situations where some of these pests could actually uh, be a pest in a situation, but be a welcomed guest in another situation. Can anybody give me an example of who or what may be uh, an actual um, pest in one situation and a welcomed guest in another? And w let's think about all pests. I mean, that could be plant materials. That could be insects. That could be mammals. That could be a disease. Could be several, several things. I mean, fungus. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because we, we'll, you know, the, we do use a fungus. I mean, we'll even coat grass seeds, you know, uh, with a type of fungus that will get rid of some insects. Bees. Yeah, bees can, can be an issue. Yeah, we, we hate being stung, but, you know, we, yeah. we really couldn't live without them. Mm -hmm. I can't stand bee stings. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we, we run into them in the landscape industry quite a bit. How many of y'all play golf? Mm -hmm. Or have kids, you know, that play soccer or football, Little League baseball? Oh, yeah. What about... What about that type of grass that we like playing on? When we, when we play golf, what grass do we want to put? What, what do we want our tee boxes to be? You know, Bermuda. 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 Who, who said bent grass? I ain't rich enough to Clint play on grass. <laughs> <laughs> I like that bent grass. Come on, man. Yeah, bent grass is beautiful, man. I, I, heck yes. I just can't afford those country clubs. I'd never be able to do that. <laughs> Stop. But, but what about like good old Bermuda grass? Mm -hmm. It is a welcomed guest when we're playing golf, watching our kids play soccer, baseball mm -hmm. fields, you know, and I love, I, you know, I hate artificial turf. I do. I hate seeing football played on mm -hmm. pasture turf. I want to see real turf grass. And uh, so it's, it's a welcome guest there. But, you know, if we've got a fescue lawn, we don't want it there. If we've got shrub beds that we're having to maintain – we don't want that Bermuda grass there. So it's going, it's going to find its way there. Right. Yeah. So there's two different situations where it's, it's welcomed or it's a pest. Thank you. So does what is, not, Hey, want? does it not have a hulled seed in it that can last like nine years in the ground or something? Oh, the actual Bermuda. Yeah. Like wild Bermuda stuff that like infringes on the pesky i believe you're right yes and that that's that's a scary situation ain't it Golly, that's an endless battle thank goodness <laughs> i'm at the coast now forget the pesky <laughs> <laughs> oh but you know it's kind of like crabgrass up here right 
you know, we fight it every year, but do we, do we honestly want to get rid of it? Because in the cool, doesn't make a good name for you, but it keeps the job. It keeps the job, don't it? It's, I mean, it's, we get two rounds out of it. We get two applications. And so it's a moneymaker for us. It's a moneymaker. But what is natural pest control? We've kind of talked about what are some examples. What is a good, good definition for natural pest control? So we know what pest control is. We're controlling the pest. You know, when we perform pest control services, we're, we're going to be making an application. We're going to be setting non, traps. Non-synthetic, non-synthetic control. Good, good, yeah. But we we may have some part of that. But Not like, man-made. Do what? Not man-made. Correct, yeah, yes. It's pest control that occurs in nature without any prompting from humans. Nothing. We have nothing to do with it. Mother Nature takes it... Um, Takes it all the way down. Mark, yeah, I can see you. I got your text here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hey, man, I got you. Okay. You don't have to see me. I just want to make sure you got me in there. Yep, yep. Thanks. Yes, sir. And so... Pest control that occurs in nature without any prompting from humankind. There is our definition. And like I said before, we humans, we've disturbed this great system and we must learn how to reestablish its effects. Humans, we like messing things up. <laughs> we do. We do. And, uh, uh, I don't know. You know, it's a shameful for some of the things that we do do to the environment. But, you know, we're green industry pros and we take a lot of heat from the general public uh, because we do use herbicides and pesticides. But you know what? We do it in a eco-friendly way, which makes us stewards of the land. Dr. Ware at A&T, she always told us that. And uh, she would say, you guys are going to be stewards of the land and you're out practicing. You got to make sure that you're doing everything right and correct because you're going to take a lot of heat when you put that backpack sprayer on, or you pull that hose off the truck. People just don't want to see it, but they don't realize that a healthy yard, meaning weed free grown at the correct height does more for the environment than, um, uh, uh, you know, anything that's out there, there's more, uh, surface area on turf grass than there are some of the larger trees just because it's so dense and thick. And there was a university study done that the, cor the correct amount of turf grass quarter acre lot raised perfectly grown perfectly weed free, thick mown at the correct height, given the correct amount of irrigation will reduce or pull more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than the family of four that lives there can put in it. So turf grass is very, very beneficial. And, you know, us taking care of it as, as turf grass managers is a good thing. And furthermore, these concepts are critical to the development of a successful integrated pest management program or IPM. Now, what I've experienced here in the last two years uh, is a decline in clients wanting any type of spraying done on their properties. Yeah. They, yeah. Don't, want, they don't want Roundup. Definitely don't want Roundup. They don't want, you know, the turf grass being sprayed. They're okay with the granular stuff because they don't really think of that as actually a chemical. You can, you know, when you're putting out your pre-emergent, you just tell them, Hey, you know, it's fertilized and they'll seem a little bit okay with that, but they do not want to see you walk around with a backpack sprayer or any type of machine spraying 
the turf grass. They want you to pull weeds by hand. Now, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to pay my guys to do that. I don't care how much money they want to pay for it. Now, there are people that will do that, and that's fine. That's, that's, that's a okay. But that needs to be more of a what I would call a personal gardener or somebody that stays on site all the time. But if you're moving from site to site, you don't have the time to stop and pull the weeds. And HOAs have become the, the real issue with this. You know, it's not your high-end residentials. They just want everything looking good. But it's the HOAs that we're seeing more of the um, don't spray our properties, hand pull the weeds. And so I've elected not to bid on any more HOAs. We are done with that. But I am in favor of an integrated pest management program. And what that means, it doesn't mean that spraying is not allowed. It means that spraying is used as the last resort. And the idea is if you have a good, healthy stand of fescue or a good stand of a warm season grass, you're not going to get the weeds. So if you're watering correctly and you're giving it the correct amount of nutrients, you're just not going to have the development of weeds. So if somebody's been on our lawn care program for over a year, they're not really going to have that many weeds. And so, you know, we may have to do some spot spraying, which again is part of IPM. I don't like the idea of broadcasting, uh, you know, liquid applications on every site. And I do not mix any of the chemicals that we use because I want to spot spray. And you'll hear some of the bigger lawn care companies say it's cheaper to make one walk, one pass across the yard with all the chemicals versus then walking over it two or three times. So I'm going to push my fertility out and then I'm going to spray our weeds because the idea is they shouldn't have that many weeds in the property uh, anyway, if they're on our program and been on it for a while. However, we're still going to have crabgrass and like i said do we really want to get rid of this one because it is a money maker and i don't know if that's what you call you know um you know doing the right thing or what but hey we're not the ones out there trying to figure out how to uh, come up with a different chemical to actually totally eradicate that we're using what the scientists are making for us uh, but think about this hey yeah john go ahead eric yes sir uh, have you tried that Maramucci stuff? It's supposed to be all natural, basically a salt. No, huh? That, <laughs> that kills the weeds immediately, about overnight. Does but it? it? Yeah, but it doesn't get the root, so they seem to come back like in a week or two. <laughs> wow. wow. Well, it's. Uh, I don't know. And you, you said you're down on the coast, right? Right. So I don't know. I haven't, and I haven't seen anybody up here doing it. So I don't know, but I'll well, definitely look actually, into it's it. It's actually really cheap. If you look into it, it's really cheap. And if you keep on it like once a month, yeah, you eventually win the battle, but it's, you know, to me, it's just a bunch of, bunch of product going out, but it's cheap. Yeah. But guess what? The client's willing to pay for that. The bigger, bucks. nothing. you really, if, huh? you, if, if you sell it to them as a all natural, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the, the problem is, is it comes right back. <laughs> oh, gotcha. <laughs> you know, it doesn't get there. It, it kills all the top and it, and it takes it down like it was almost as if it was like a really strong Roundup Pro. Yeah. Uh, but it seems to come back up through, it doesn't kill the roots. It, it takes like multiple applications to get it. So, it still works out to be cheaper in the overall, but it's a lot of applications. Yeah. But which could be beneficial to you, to that client that doesn't want to have pesticides on their product and say, look, it's going to take multiple applications, but we are putting out something that does not contain pesticides. Right. It's a good product. Y'all should check that out. And what was the name I of it again? I think you get it. Site one. It's Site like one. Mar- Mar- yeah. Maramucci. Maramucci. Okay. 
Miramuchi. What did she say? I was just repeating oh. the, the, the name. Oh, repeating oh. the name. Got you. Sorry. Miramuchi. But crabgrass, 2,000 seeds per square foot in a single season. What happens when we mow a property that is full of crabgrass? Spread the seeds. We spread it, don't we? It gets all in the mowers. It gets all over weed eaters. It gets on our boots. Mm -hmm. It gets on our jeans. And we're taking it to the next property. And we shouldn't do that. So, again, part of IPM is to clean the machines, just taking the backpack blowers and blowing off the decks, underneath the decks, and actually, you know, making sure you don't have it on your pants legs before you walk in to the next yard. Get old picture of it. Now, when it comes to house flies, you know, it's summertime's around the corner. So, we're going we're gonna to start seeing these, these bad boys. You know, I've seen a few, but they're going to get, you know, very predominant here very shortly. Mm -hmm. But the common fly can lay 600 eggs, which mature in about six days in hot weather. Mm. What do you think would happen if these flies had no natural predators? And I'm not talking about mama's fly swatter. <laughs> I'm talking about if they didn't have the things out there that are going to kill them or eat them, what do you think would happen? What do you think would happen to, to earth in general? It'd be a disaster. It would be a major, major disaster. Yes, it would. At that reproductive rate, a pair of original flies could eventually lead to a layer of flies thousands of feet thick around the entire planet in just one summer. Hmm. Uh, don't believe me. Get out your calculators on your phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it don't take but a couple times of hitting, you know, 600 times 600 times 600, and the calculator stops calculating it. Mm -hmm. That reproductive rate in a matter of, you know, three to four months, meaning no rain, hot and dry, just the way the flies like it. We would be covered. But why has that not happened? It has not happened because of natural pest controls. The birds, spiders, the rain, <laughs> disease. So what are some of natural controls that we see? The most important ones are climate and weather. Food and habitat, pathogens, predators, parasites, and protozoids. And so think about this. When it comes to the common cockroach, they are in every household. I don't care your income levels. I don't care if you're in a $5 million house or if you're in a you know, $50,000 house. Everybody's got cockroaches. The problem with a cockroach is when we see one. And what does that mean when we see one? There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. They know natural <laughs> predators in that house. And so they don't want to see us. They want to be where it's cold, like cool and dark and damp. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be hanging around pipes, you know, behind the wall, the pipe sweat. So they've got, mm -hmm. they can drink there. But when you see one run across the tile floor in the kitchen, that ain't good. That means he's been kicked out of the walls, you know? Uh -huh. There's too many in there, so he's going to start his own little family. So you got too many of them. And basically, you know, they're going to come out and get the dog food. And so you'll see people set dog food bowls inside of another bowl with water. Cockroach can't get to it. Mm-hmm. Pathogen, of course, you know, is always going to take out stuff. Predators. That's just part of mother nature. And then with the parasites and protozoids. What's the difference between the two there? Which one kills the host? Is it a parasite or the protozoid? 
Fritosoid, they're going to kill the host. That's going to be your parasitic wasp. Parasites, mm-hmm. they're just going to knock it. You know, they're going to make it sick, but they're not actually going to kill it. They're just going to live on it and, and use it for the resources uh, that they can get from it. And then climate and weather. And so we're going to look at these each in detail. And so climate and weather, the difference between the two. And I swear, sometimes here in North Carolina, we see all four seasons in one day. (laughs) All the time. Yes. Snowing in the morning, rain Mm -hmm. at lunch. You're having to take off the sweatshirt and jacket in the afternoon. It's crazy. The climate is the long-term overview of temperature and humidity changes in a region, whereas weather is the local and short-term variation in climate. Now, when it comes to landscapes, we've got different microclimates that can actually be a problem. And so some of the plant material that we see that is planted in people's homes would not have this issue if they were planted in the correct microclimate, meaning that if the plant was to get full sun, it wouldn't develop that disease. If Mm -hmm. that plant was planted in full sun, it may not have the issue with the insects that it does. So there's a lot of people out there planting plants that really don't know their plant material. And when they just start putting stuff in the ground, Mm -hmm. We're going to see more issues with climate and weather. I can tell my battery is getting dead in my mouth. It always happens in something like this. But weather, again, the local and short-term variation in climate. Now, with the tomato hornworm. Mm. um, What's up, you all? These guys, do they like what kind of what kind of winter favors the tomato hornworm? Mild, huh? Mild, mild. Well, they like they like it dry too. They like a dry yeah. winter. And we we get big too. They will get big. And I was in the, <laughs> in the dang pet store not long ago. And they were selling these things for like five bucks a piece because there's some type of lizard that people have (laughs) as a pet (laughs) and it's like their favorite food. There again, that'd be an iguana. Yeah. (laughs) But you know, people going there buying three or four for 15 and 20 bucks. I'm like, man, shoot. All you got to do is have a grow you some tomatoes and you're going to get these guys, but they like a dry winter. Because they're, they're in the ground right now, and they're going to get drowned out if we have a wet winter. We've had pretty, I mean, we've had some snow here. We've had some rain. So we've had a pretty, pretty wet winter in my books. So it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, kind of test this hypothesis and see how big of an infestation do we have uh, with tomatoes when it comes to that. Food and habitat. No food, no organisms. Pest must have something to eat. And the simplest non-toxic method of control can be limiting the pest access to food. Remove it. Again, the dog food bowls, setting it in water or actually, you know, feeding them, you know, outside, especially in the summertime. Here we have an example. We have the ash aphid on the Modesto ash trees. Now, um, what do people like doing with these ash trees? It's kind of a crate murder situation. People like cutting these things back. Well, what happens when we cut trees back when we when we top them? What do we get? A lot of sap on that. Get a we get a lot of sap. We we'll get a lot of we get that flush growth, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just going to get real thick. And our ancestors used to do this and it's called pilarding. 
And our ancestors used to do it, especially in the European countries where they would plant trees real close to the house and they would have, you know, brick homes. And in the wintertime, they would top these trees to allow more sunlight to come in and heat the outside brick. So they did it as a warming effect. And they also like doing it because in the springtime, you got that flush of growth, which cooled the house in the summertime. It was more thick and no sunlight can penetrate the dense foliage. Plus they said it gave them more extra firewood, but pollarding it's been around for, for years. And we've just taken it to the extreme here with crepe myrtles and, and a lot of other trees. Mm. People just want to top them. But when you do that with the ash, with the ash tree, you're going to get that ash aphid because they love the sucker growth. That's where mm -hmm. they're going to live. So when you're doing IPM program and they haven't topped the trees, if you see any sucker growth, even on crepe myrtles, cut the sucker growth out, cut those water sprouts out because that's where the aphids are going oh. to be. And they create that nasty sooty yeah. mold, uh -huh. which can be very dangerous. You know, it can drop on sidewalks, people, joggers and walkers could run through it and slip on it. If somebody parks their car underneath it, it could eat the paint off the car. So it's very, very uh, dangerous to actually have. Uh, the aphids have two population peaks each season. It corresponds when the nitrogen levels are at the highest in the foliage. Spring leaf unfold and then fall leaf drop. Well, what are we doing this time of year? What are we doing? Fertilizing. When we're fertilizing, right? Yeah. And so we're actually adding to the problem. And so if we can avoid that, if we know we're going to have aphid problems or these types of trees or these types of plants are subject to it, we may have to, we may have to recalculate our lawn care program and, and maybe skip it because we're just adding to it. They need the nitrogen for it. Don't create more of a problem with the nitrogen applications. Here's a quote I took from Plagues and Peoples by William McNeil, and I think it's so, so um, fitting for what we've just been through the past two years. But one can properly think of most human lives as caught in a precarious equilibrium between the microparitism of disease organisms and the macroparitism of large body predators, chief among which have been other human beings. And so... Look what COVID has done to us. We've spread it to each other. If we didn't quarantine, uh, and, and a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, lost their lives uh, to it. And they more still. Yep. It's a scary thing. And, and my family, we all got it over Christmas. And that is one thing I hope I never get again. But pathogens. We see it in nature all the time. And, and I remember this, you know, especially growing up as, as, as a little boy uh, wanting to, to turkey hunt and deer hunt and stuff like that. I remember never, ever having deer around here. And now it's like we see multiple every single day. Same thing with turkey. You know, we used to have to travel to go turkey hunting like two to three hours away just to even get a chance at seeing a bird. But the competition for habitat has really crept in on them and they've moved down this way. And here in a, here in a month or so, it'll be prime time for it. And we'll see them here on the farm, but overpopulation leads to disease. And you've seen that in the deer population. That's why it's so, you know, prominent that we, maintain the herds so that they don't actually get the disease and wipe out the entire population. When resources are depleted, you're going to see malnutrition and then you're going to see them moving like they have into here. And of course with humans, it's always led to disease and war. Mm -hmm.
And with pathogens, plants and animals have been doing it long before humans were around. But guess what? These critters are going to be here long after we are gone. That's right. They are adaptable, and they will get through it. Uh, Predators, critical in the suppression of natural populations of animals and plants, and together with pathogens and peritosoids that make up the wonderful world of biological control. And there are companies that actually grow these parasitic wasps and the ladybugs and will sell them to you. And like I said, it works great uh, in maybe the small gardens, but definitely in greenhouse situations, possibly even some nurseries. It always helps. But they can be mammals. They can be arthropods. They can be microorganisms or even fungus. They are the free living general feeder, uh, feeders and they, I'm sorry about this mouse, uh, but they may eat single prey at a meal or they may consume many individuals as the convergent lady beetle. And I was watching, I was scrolling through my uh, social media feed and somebody had had a video of ladybugs devouring these aphids and it was so cool to actually see that it was actually on a uh, uh, jalapeno pepper plant that <laughs> were some aphids on it and then there was that ladybug she's just walking around the, the actual plant picking them off and the we aphids let some, hey we let some go in the day lily farm because we got them so bad one year yeah and as long as you let them go real slow and up under all the foliage, they find the food. So they stick around for quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, it's more than you think if they think there's a lot of food there. Uh, they're not going to fly away until they're done full. And <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I wasted some money on that. <laughs> but it's funny, the aphids, they just, you know, I, I would think if I saw my my family member get eaten and taken away. I think I would try to leave the situation. Well, they mm-hmm. just kind of stay there. Predatory insects in the larval stage must consume several prey to attain maturity. And so the predator adults lay their eggs near the populations of prey where the hatching young have a chance of obtaining food. Spiders are the exception. And what do they do? It's going to build that web that is the coolest thing and speaking of what is mother nature's number one pest control which animal do you think it is what do i miss price i'm sorry i was trying to get the dog to stop oh okay i'm sorry (laughs) that's okay is it the spider (laughs) it is the spider it is the spider they do more for us as landscapers than probably any other insect out there. And people scared to death of them. And, you know, I, I admit if I see a black widow, brown recluse, I'm like, yeah, yikes. I want to get rid of it. Nothing yeah. worse than riding a mower first thing in the morning in the web and the spider's right on your face. Yes. <laughs> yes. Go underneath that tree and boom. Yep. You're covered. And you just, you feel like, you feel like something's crawling all over you all day long. Mm-hmm. But the spider is awesome, and it gets rid of a lot of our problems that we may encounter with other insects. Mm-hmm. And like I said, they'll, they'll lay this web. They'll lay it anywhere that light reflects on that web. And even, even on um, you know porch lights, floodlights, you'll see a web across that because the insects are drawn to the light for the heat, and they fly right into the nest or the web parasites and protozoids again what's the difference the paras the parasite just kind of catches a ride um it'll debilitate it but it's not actually going to kill it and then the protozoid will actually um kill it and so example of parasites the pinworm and like i said Mm -hmm. the parasites can regulate Cannot regulate a pest, but they can debilitate it. And speaking of parasites, what you know when when dogs get worms, 
what's what's one way you know with our um the medicine that we give the dog what is it how's it actually killing those worms it's got poison is it a poison yeah strict nine yeah <laughs> what what's another way that they're doing it there there's there is some of these dog dewormers that will prevent the worm from uptaking sugar in the stomach. Mm. And so literally they're kind of starving themselves to death, to death. And they're actually experimenting with that with, with cancer patients because the good old dog warmer prevents cancer from uptaking sugar, which it needs to grow and spread. That's so nice. It's kind of crazy with some of this stuff that's that's happening out there in modern medicine. Paratosoids uh, are the unsung heroes of naturally occurring insect control. They are too small to notice. They have no common names, and their scientific names are way too long and difficult to, to speak and to spell. So we really don't know much about them other than that they work. They are members of the insect order with the bees and the wasp, and they are host specific. They are restricted in the number of species they can attack. And that's why these biological companies are mass producing them for a particular insect that they will attack. And here is the actual parasitic wasp injecting her eggs into the aphid and then if you see that black pinhole on the side of an aphid that means that it has been um you know it was a host of the eggs the eggs hatched and they ate the guts from the inside out so how effective are they on an infestation uh i would say in a greenhouse very very effective mm -hmm. but you know in a in a front foundation planting or whatever or nursery, they're just kind of going to fly away. Probably, um, they they need to be kind of trapped. So, um, I don't know if there's a way. Maybe, I don't know. I just don't see it see it happening in the landscape side. Have you tried any? No. But I was curious if we could convince them to just like stay in there. Like, there's a lot of food in here. <laughs> I don't know if if it's possible to do some type of netting on the shrubs that have it, and then or maybe lay, a, lay lay some plastic across it real quick for a half a day, maybe. Yeah, I'm just wondering how, how do you know how much they can actually ingest, or uh, what do you say, inject a day? I, that I don't know. I guess it would depend on how many wasp that that you did release. Um, but I don't. I don't actually know their. So it's not like they can eat X amount of mosquitoes a day, uh, kind of theory. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know actually the reproductive rate of um, the actual wasp. It'd be cool if they were like the common house fly. You know, yeah, right. <laughs> every six days they're they're hatching. So um but yeah, then it'd be uh, worth buying them. Yes. Yeah. And uh you know, but I you know, I wonder how homeowners would feel about releasing wasp into their properties anyway, especially if they have young children outside playing on swing sets and you know, you tell that to a mother and she's probably gonna like, Oh no, 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 no. So or you tell them it's like the chemical, they're going to need to stay off for about four to six hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which may, may be tough in the summertime when mama's going crazy. But how do natural controls work? They work all the time. But why do some pest populations grow so large that they become a problem? Us. Us. Now, here's two examples. Uh, House plants. We've brought them inside. They're still in a lot of people's houses. We're going to be setting them outside here pretty soon. Well, a lot of them are starting to look kind of shabby in places uh, because they've been inside too long. They're, they're starting to get a little weak. They're not getting the natural light that they need. 
what happens to these house plants almost overnight when we are able to set them outside? They perk up because they are exposed to the beneficial insects as well as the bad ones. But they're getting the light that they need. They're getting the fresh air that they need. And they're getting those beneficial insects that are eating some of the scale and stuff like that that they may develop inside. Now, there was a situation in California uh, with some oak trees. And homeowners got furious. And it took two ag agents to really dive deep into the situation and see what was happening. These oak trees uh, were being, I mean, totally obliviated by the oak moth. They were defoliating mm -hmm. them and just stripping them clean of any foliage. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard to believe that people in California wanted pesticide applications. They're just kind of yeah. known for not wanting, um, you know, the chemical use. But they either wanted their trees cut down or they wanted a pesticide to get rid of the moth. Right. But it took these ag agents to really study this and found out that the moth was very, very beneficial to the oaks mm -hmm. because they only came to the oak trees during the dry season. When they got defoliated, what did they not lose during the dry season? Moisture. Moisture. They kept the water that they had. They did not have any water leave through evapotranspiration. They didn't leave, lose any water through their leaves, which is beneficial. Well, when those moths were sitting there munching away, what did they actually do while they were eating? Fertilize the tree. Fertilizing the tree. They had the droppings. They were sitting there munching away, and they were releasing it right at the base of the tree. And so when the rains returned, these oak trees had a sufficient supply of natural fertilizer. Mother Nature was working for these oak trees, but people wanted to cut them down or they wanted to drench them in a pesticide. And it was a good thing that these two ag agents really jumped in there and said, no, this is beneficial for the trees. And so we need to learn more about these fluctuations that are part of natural cycle of events in our ecosystems. And we have to adjust our aesthetic opinions and reactions accordingly. Aesthetic goes a long ways. People are scared to death when they see spider web. Leave it alone. More than likely, you're not going to see the spider. They don't want nothing to do with you anyway. But leave them there and let them do their thing with the insects. Most of our serious pest problems arise through accidental and occasionally deliberate but misguided introductions of exotic species. And here's a list of them. Indoor cockroaches. They were introduced here to the U.S. The gypsy moth, Jap beetle, Mediterranean fruit fly, Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, dandelions, kudzu, and water hyacinth. <laughs> all introduced here. They're not natural. And when we breed plants to satisfy human desires, we sometimes destroy traits that discourage insects. Some of these hybrid roses just aren't as tough as grandma's old roses. We shouldn't, shouldn't breed them. We must thoroughly investigate how we can maintain the natural controls when altering plants or combining plant materials from different environments. We must bring it together. All right. So we are at 51 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share. Let's see.